Batman Detective Comics has always been a fun run where they just tell one-off Batman storylines normally. Sometimes they get interlinked a little bit, but the general idea of Batman Detective Comics seems to be basically telling stories that can be told on their own. There was a really fun run that I truly enjoyed that came out around 2019 to 2020. And they told a bunch of stories such as Cold Vengeance, A Viking Ghost, The Return of Two-Face, The Joker, and The Court of the Owls, A Weird Ghost Murder Mystery, Hush Comes Back, and The Return of the Huntress. These were six separate storylines that we did here on the channel. And I thought it would be fun to bring you guys a compilation of these storylines in the Batman Detective Comics run. This is the Comic Storian channel where I take some of your favorite comic books, I break them down into audio dramas, and I read them back to you so you can understand what's going on and decide what you want to add to your collection. Typically, I pick comic books that I truly did enjoy and what are my favorites and what I recommend. So, like I said, I'm recommending Batman Detective Comics. A long time ago, a young Bruce Wayne was sitting in a tree not wanting to eat. His mother Martha came out asking what he was doing up there. Didn't he hear her calling for him? Bruce told her that he didn't want to go. They make him sad. Martha climbs up, sitting beside him, telling him that she knows. Orphanages make her sad as well. But that's why they're so important. These children have so little, while they have so much. Every child deserves what they have, to have people love them. Until they can find them a family, they will keep them safe, protect them, care for them, show them that they are worth caring for. The Martha Wayne Orphanage was a happy and special place to be. Now it's dark and cold, a place where sometimes even the children run away. One night while going through some chatter online about explosions, Lucius Fox came to Batman with a concern. You see, the night before, a 15-year-old boy by the name of Miguel Flores ran away. Batman says that it happens sometimes. Troubled teens run away all the time, but he'll look into it. Lucius tells him that this isn't the first time from this particular orphanage. By his count, it's the third in this year. And while it may not be the highest priority to Batman, Batman turns in his chair. I said I'll investigate the orphanage tonight while I'm on patrol. I can access the office's end. Lucius stops him. Actually, it's your orphanage. It's named after your mother. It may not be exactly how you operate, but given that your name is on the building, you could actually visit without sneaking in through a window. Maybe you could even make yourself presentable. Take something for the kids. The next morning, Batman visits the orphanage, but not as Batman, but rather as Bruce Wayne. Bruce meets with the orphanage director, Peter Morrison, telling him that he isn't quite sure what to bring the children, so he bought them equipment and supplies for a new science and art center, and an ice cream truck. Peter laughs, stating that he brought education and camouflaged it with sugar. Very clever, Mr. Wayne. This is all very generous, but I'm afraid that we might not be able to accommodate it all. Bruce tells him, of course, sorry. If there isn't enough room, I'll have to build another wing then. But there is something that is bothering him. A child ran away last night. Peter tells him, yes, Miguel, we're all a little worried. Bruce asks if there could be any particular reason the child ran away, and Peter tells him that he wishes he knew, but sometimes this kind of thing happens, especially with the older ones. When they realize that it's unlikely, they'll... well... Bruce asks if he can look at the security footage, and when he looks at it, he notices something very specific about Miguel. He looks... scared. Peter says that it was a pretty big jump off the wall that he's climbing, and Bruce tells him, yes, it is. So later that night, Batman calls Damien, and Damien asks if he knows the boy. Bruce tells him no. So Damien tells him, So, you're okay to put some effort in for a kid you don't even know, but not, you know what? Forget it. Bruce tells him that he's sorry that he hasn't had time for his son. The city is in danger, and that requires his full attention, but it's getting colder, and somewhere out there, a scared child needs their help. Damien asks, you want me to help find the kid because you're worried an already scared kid might not react so well to being chased by a giant bat? Sure. But if we're going to talk about these orphanages, it's a bit disconcerting that you own whole buildings full of potential backup robins. So Damien took to the streets gathering information while Batman remained focused on taking down the bad guys. It started as a couple of days and then a couple of weeks, all while Gotham grew colder and colder. But finally, when it seemed like it was all for nothing, Damien did find Miguel. He radioed back, stating that he found him, but they're going to need help. Like, now. Batman races over in the Batmobile, running out of the car with Damien telling him, I got a tip from some women in a shelter, but Miguel. Batman hurries over to pick up the child out of the snow, and Damien asks, What do you want me to do now? 
Batman tells him, Nothing. You did well. Go home. As Batman sits Miguel in the car, Damien says that he doesn't want to leave him. And once the two of them have Miguel secure, Batman tells Damien to notify Gotham General that they're coming. Soon Miguel begins to groan and Batman asks, Can you hear me? Miguel mutters cold. Batman tells him, I know. But Miguel then asks, Are you taking me back? I, I don't want to. Batman tells him, No, we're not. We're going to get you help. Just keep talking. Everything will be okay. <coughs> I, I, you're not scary. I like they said, I'm, I'm sorry. For what? My new favorite superhero. It's Superman. <laughs> I'll let you in on a little secret. Superman's my favorite too. Damien then asks, why did he run? And Miguel tells him to that place. It wasn't finding parrots for all the kids. Some kids just disappeared. He wanted to escape before he disappeared too. He wanted to stop it from happening. He wanted to protect the other kids. He wanted to help. He didn't know who to tell, who to trust, who'd believe him. Grownups never... They never believe. It's okay, I believe you. And we're gonna find those missing kids. You protected them. I saved them? Yeah, you saved them, Miguel. He begins to cry and when Damien looks over, he notices Miguel's not breathing. Batman rushed into the hospital where the doctors try to bring him back, but it's too late. So later that night, Batman wraps his hands as he hits the punching bag in the cave and Lucius comes down asking if he was able to save the city. Yes. And the boy as well? Batman hits the bag harder. After another hit, Batman looks at him. The orphanage records. There's no sign of foul play. There's a thorough follow-up with each of the adopted families. The records are meticulous. Not a single discrepancy. Every child. Batman takes off his mask and Lucius asks, what is it? He tells Lucius to wake Damien and get to the car. But Lucius points over at the Batmobile, telling him that it's right there. And Batman tells him, no, the other car. Later that morning, Bruce and Damien go to the orphanage, and Bruce tells him to wait out here for the police to arrive. He goes inside, and Peter asks, what is going on? Bruce tells him, come with me to your office. As the door closes, Bruce sets down a file stating, you keep very good records. Measurements, weights, histories, allergies, injuries, academic and social progress for every child. You track them for years after. Peter tells him that he isn't sure how he got those records, but while none of this would be possible without him, that information is supposed to be confidential, Mr. Wayne. Bruce tells him, only, this isn't every child. I don't understand. But he's interrupted as the sound of police sirens begin to grow. Peter asks why the police here and Bruce tells him, they're here for you. The records were perfect for every child, but it came down to the numbers. These children, there are no records for these children at all. They have no names, they disappeared. These children don't exist. Bruce begins to circle some of the children on the photos on the wall and Peter stutters, I, Please, you have to understand. I never wanted to hurt them, but these people, they came with the money first and then the threats, and I couldn't say no to them, I had no choice. Before he could finish, Bruce turns, punching him. Damien whispers, you realize you're not wearing the mask, right? Bruce tells him that it's not Batman's name on the building. It's the Wayne name, it's our name. These are Wayne children. They're my responsibility. These are children that I have failed. We're going to track down every missing child and we're going to punish every single person who took them. And two months later, the Martha Wayne orphanage wasn't cold anymore. The children inside were protected. Bruce was going to show them that they care for them. And the Miguel Flores Science and Arts Center is the first step to that. It was another snowy night in Gotham as Batman takes out another group of no-name thugs trying to rob a jewelry store just before Christmas. In a few moments as Batman drops one of the thugs on the hood of a police car, the officer rolls down his window stating, Evening. And Batman tells him that it was a B&E Grant's jewelry. Name's Aaron Morton, warned Gordon about him. Batman then says that it's 1239. He has six minutes. Approach. The officers arresting the thug ask, approach what? But Batman turns back, shushing them, telling them that he wasn't talking to them. Just then, the Batmobile speeds up, and Batman jumps in, leaving just as quick as the Batmobile arrived. Within a few moments, he pulls into the cave as Ace and Titus patiently wait, and he pets them, asking, Who's up for a bit of catch? After taking the dogs out, Bruce takes off his costume, throwing the ball, and after a bit, he stops falling to his knees. Ace and Titus sit beside him, and he quietly says, Damn it, Alfred. Damn it all to hell. Later, back in costume, he climbs through the window of Harvey Bullock's office. Batman skips the pleasantries, telling him that he wants to talk about the Botanical Garden murders. 
and he wants details. After Bullock gives up all the information, Batman tells him he's going to go look into it. Bullock goes back to his paperwork, telling him that if he had a cereal box, he'd look inside and give him a tin badge. But since he isn't a cop, how about closing the window on the way out? He's got overtime shifts to figure out. So later at the Botanical Gardens, Batman walks through the park where sits Gotham's largest Christmas tree, and on it, several bodies are hanging from its limbs. It's almost ritualistic, but there's one more body that didn't make it to the tree. Batman takes a closer look at the one chained to it, and aside from the axe in the head, his chest has been ripped open and his ribs broken outward. And what's more, there's a divot in the ground. Batman grapples onto the tree to get a better look and finds a carving in the ground which goes along with his ritualistic suspicions. Later, Batman calls Bullock, and Bullock asks, who the hell is interrupting his holy night? Batman tells him that they have a ritualistic killing, and Bullock tells him, tell me something I don't know. Batman goes on explaining. It's a pagan ritual to be more specific. The symbol left behind is a woman with the sun. Looks like an abstract connection to monster stories and the like. The victim with the ax in the head and the spine splayed out, the centerpiece of what they're calling the Blood Eagle. And Bullock asks if they should be calling a Hawkman or something then. And while Batman hangs up, making him appear to be not very amused. Back in the cave, he's chuckling to himself. <laughs> Hawkman. Later in the city, Lucius looks at his watch, asking where the hell is he? At that moment, a limo screeches by and Bruce steps out, waving to everyone as Lucius asks, were you waiting until the new year to light the tree? Bruce plays it off, telling him, July 4th, actually. And as he takes the podium, he tells everyone, hello, this annual tradition means a lot to me. Getting to watch my mother and father light the tree here in Wayne Plaza years ago was always a favorite day for me. It's a tradition that goes back over a hundred years, and hopefully a tradition that will last a hundred more Christmases to come. So let's hear Gotham roar as we brighten up the city with a Yuletide spirit and welcome in. But at that moment, a large Viking man steps out of the tree, wielding an ax, yelling, Jorabolt! The Viking slams the ax down, narrowly missing Bruce, but before he can get back up, the large man is attacking him again. Bruce manages to stop the swing by grabbing the handle of the ax, but out of the corner of his eye, he sees an exposed electrical wire from where the man first struck. He thinks to himself that he hopes the big guy is as predictable as he looks, and he makes a break for the wire. Lucius yells for him to look out, but just as Bruce gets there, the Viking lifts the massive ax, bringing it down, and hits the exposed wire, electrocuting himself. The police arrive, asking Bruce if he's alright, and he tells them yes, but he whispers to Lucius that he needs to get home. And as Bruce goes to leave, he grabs a hair from our Viking. Back home, he begins to find out more information about the sun goddess and her rituals, while the Viking is taken to the hospital. But when the officers keeping watch hear a clanging sound coming from the room, they storm in with their guns drawn, asking, WHAT THE HELL IS? But before they could even finish those sentences, two fiery chains whip out, slamming into the ground, pulling them all out of the window. Back in the cave, Batman gets the report back on the hair that he plucked and sees that all of the readings are normal, meaning that he is most likely not a time traveler or a metahuman. He's apparently a modern day Viking. The computer then changes to the next slide of a missing persons report of Soren Rinsdale, which is the positive match for the hair collected. Soren didn't have a criminal record, scarce social media presence, unmarried, no red flag connections, goes silent last week on December 21st, winter solstice. So Batman returns to the botanical gardens to try and look and see if there's something that he missed, but he quickly notices that the carvings from before now has no snow on it. Also, the tree that the man was chained from has no frost sticking to it, and it's warm to the touch. As Batman is trying to put together our mystery though, a chain lashes out, grabbing him by the neck, and a hooded man begins to shout in Icelandic. Everyone yells, More sacrifice for the sun goddess! Batman stands, pulling the chains off, telling them, I can speak your language. Your gods are myths. Your myths are an excuse for murders. The hooded man grabs the Viking, telling the others that the Night Wolf will not stay for long. He needs to prepare the gateway to hell. Warrior, send the disbeliever to the underworld. A large man grabs Batman, slamming him into the ground, telling him, as you wish, Elder. The Elder places the Viking on the tree, stating that the winter's chill pierces the flesh and binds the sun to. But the Viking then begins to wake up asking, wait, where am I? Jack, wait, Jack, it's me, Soren, what happened? The Elder raises his hands, stating that the solstice sows strength to those who would honor you. Through this sacrifice, send the bridge to the land of gods. Soren yells out in panic, Wait, I'm not a sacrifice! 
and the elder places his thumbs onto Soren's mouth. The path shall be opened. It's a road crafted of blood, bone, and flesh. From hell, through our mother, to our land, hail to the knight and all of her sisters. As a bright red light shines from Soren's mouth, a chain whips around the elder's neck, and using the chain that was on him, Batman pulls the elder to the ground. But as he says that they will try it his way, a red monster begins to speak in a demonic voice. Hail the sons and daughters of the fallen day. The giant red monster claws its way out of Soren's mouth, yelling that their prayers have been heard by the riders of Asgard. God is here! Batman throws out a few batterings, but they bounce off and the creature grabs him, sniffing him, telling him, You are something else. You are not of this land or language. Batman tells him, Damn right I'm not! And the monster scoffs. I can tell you the truth then. There is no sun goddess, no Norse gods, but in your land, you abuse us. Key words to open up the doors in the weak-minded. Tendrils whip out, grabbing one of the followers, pulling him into its maw, and Batman now realizes just who the Elder is. His name is Jack Elder, an out-of-work actor who formed a group called the Norsemen Rising. It was a way for him to collect money and pay his tax debt. Like they say, follow the money. The creature pulls a chain around Elder's neck and Batman tries to stop it. But the pull is too strong and Elder yells out, I am ready to face the night, goddess son. One of the tendrils stabs Elder in the chest and the red light begins to shine brighter until it disappears. Soren sits up asking if he's alive. Later, back at Wayne Manor, Bruce looks over his findings, stating that Elder's plan was to use Rinsdale as a pagan sacrifice and gateway during the ceremony to call forth the creatures like the Big Red Devil. However, Rinsdale broke free before they could and went on his own murder spree, thinking that he was a harbinger for the annual Yuletide sacrifice based on Nordic tradition. These creatures were meant to start some sort of wild hunt that would cleanse the earth or something along those lines. We'll run the details past Constantine. Not expecting too much, seeing cultists like this too many times. It was always the same, whether it's religion, politics, money, it's an excuse for bad people to do bad things. Hopefully that's all it is, and not a sign of something wicked coming. Harvey Dent was born in Gotham City, but he has been hurting all the time. He grew up in the city, and the pain was right behind his eye. He worked in the city, bled it dry, died in the city. And now there's a scraping, a bug in his eye. He needs to dig it out. He needs to crush it, kill it, kill them both. No, gotta flip it, flip it now. Two-Face takes out his coin, stating that it's all about good and even, a constant battle, a deadly toll on both sides. A man yells to go to hell. He can't squeeze nothing out of him or his brother. They're connected. So Two-Face flips the coin, stating that he did ask politely. And they both refused his fair offer. Now he is forced to flip. He catches the coin, pulling his hand away, seeing the scratched upside showing tails. He says that they should have made a deal for those coins because now it's death for the DeMarco brothers. Later, Batman arrives at the Black Market Coin Dealership. Rare coins stolen from private and government collections, quid pro quo trades in minting houses, been going on for over a century. But someone had a specific shopping list. Silver dollars, peace dollars to be exact. Every year left behind except for the 1922. Batman looks over at the DeMarco brothers, each one of their eyes shot out, even by the usual modus operandi. Been gone a long time, was wondering when you'd come back. Harvey. Batman continues looking around, smelling a mixture of two types of bullets that were shot, meaning that the DeMarcos had to have shot back. Perhaps that bullet hit someone. After examining the nearby blood splatter and bullet holes in the wall, Batman pulls a bullet out of the wall, seeing blood on it. Once he gets back to the cave, Batman examines the slug and sees the blood on it is indeed two faces. Now, where is he? Meanwhile, at Urgent MD walk-in clinic, Two-Face yells to hurry and get to work. Don't talk, just pull it out. The doctor begins to reach inside the gunshot wound, telling him, yeah, yes, of course. The first shot passed in and out. The second is a bit more problematic. 
Two-Face screams as the doctor begins to extract the bullet, telling him, I'm sorry if that hurt, I'll try to be a bit more. But Two-Face flips the coin and its heads. In a much softer tone, he says, I appreciate the delicate position that I have placed you in, and I apologize if my appearance is unnerving. The scarring on the rest of my body is fresh. The doctor tells him that he can assure him that that isn't the case. It's the second bullet that is lodged into his shoulder. And without seeing, Two-Face flips the coin again, but this time it's tails. He asks the doctor, What are you trying to do to me? You ain't nothing but a damn butcher! Two-Face begins to shoot the doctor. Still flipping the coin, it comes back to heads, and the softer tone returns. And he looks down, asking, What, what did I do? He begins to hit the gun on the side of his scarred head, shouting, What is happening to me? What is going on? Right, right, extraction. Need to remove the bullet myself now. After jamming the tweezers in and pulling the bullet out, the doctor groans and Two-Face asks, Are you still alive? Once he catches it, he looks at it and begins to shoot again. But later out on patrol, Batman hears a police scanner stating that there was gunfire reported at the HealthWise Urgent Care, and he quickly begins to make his way over there. Once he arrives, there's already three men in white and black jumpers pouring gas all over the place, stating that they cannot leave a trace that he was here. Burn it! Burn it all! As the other two men grab a Molotov and light it, the fire is extinguished when Batman grabs a hold of it. As he punches, he asks, What are you doing here? What are those outfits you're wearing? Why are you wiping this place? One yells that he's disrupting the balance, and another grabs a metal IV holder, cracking it across the back of Batman's head. But when Batman turns around, the man nervously steps back. A second later, the man who swung the metal stand is thrown through the wall while the other one begins going into his bag. He pulls out a gun and Batman yells, What are you doing? Can't you smell the gas? The man yells, Kill the Batman for him! And he pulls the trigger, setting off the gas, blowing up the entire room. Batman grabs the men, throwing them out the window, telling them, I'd rather be saving the murdered doctor, not these. But the men begin to cough as they gasp for air, and Batman tells them that they will survive. Now give me the location. One of the men states that it's their duty to clean up after, but another man yells at him to shut up. They took an oath on their knees before him. Suddenly, all three men begin to groan as there's a faint click coming from one of their necks. Batman asks, what are they doing? For God's sakes, what the hell? Stop! All the men slump over dead, self-inflicted brain implosions. It seems Two-Face is taking up a new road. Elsewhere, Two-Face begins to give communion for his followers. Those that are in white and those that are in black. The ones in white represent the Harvey side and the black, the Two-Face side. After blessing the last person, Two-Face yells that there are two of them and Gotham will face all of them. As the ceremony continues, Two-Face tells his followers, to know the light is to know the dark, and to know the dark is to know the light. The coins that he has given them will all represent freedom, clarity, purity of choice, and more importantly, soul. But the choice of, let your heart and mind fully embrace it. Seeing the world in black and white is a grace note. Life is a simple equation. Fundamental arithmetic is their core religion. One and one do not make two. One and one make one. As the coin is flipped, it comes back to heads, and Two-Face says that the path for the evening has been chosen. Vice will lead his brethren into the streets to serve and protect Gotham. Seeing Two-Face struggle to even speak or keep a straight head, the white-wearing Vice asks if he is okay. The black-wearing Verse says that he looks shaken, and another flip of the coin is called for. Two-Face tells him that he battles the light and the dark for all of them. He alone dictates if and when the coin is flipped. Vice then leaves with his men, stating, To mind a war is crueler than his brother can comprehend. They honor and respect his edicts, as always. But Vice's methods of protecting Gotham are more of the method of gunning down the various criminals of the city, including some of the more well-known individuals. However, while Two-Face's followers deliver their version of justice, Batman collects samples from the followers that died and begins to run scans on their blood. What he finds is that each person has been diagnosed with a terminal condition. Cancers of the brain, lungs, pancreas, and throats. That is what ties them all together. What's more, all of these men have seemingly at one point or another crossed paths with Gotham Courthouse. Batman gets ready to head back out, telling himself that that will be the next stop. As he drives out of the cave, and he sees something in his way. He swerves as the Batmobile screeches to a halt, and Batman jumps out as Two-Face calls out to him, but by his first name. Batman shouts, asking what happened to him. Why are you here? And Two-Face says, 
do not pretend to know me. I can't describe it. I need help. Batman asks, who am I supposed to believe? And Two-Face tells him any kind of emotional, physical, or psychological spike is causing me to flip with or without my coin. I feel like I'm a puppet trying to fight my way out of a nightmare. Help me, Bruce! Cut these strings! Batman tells him that the only way to help is to bring him to Arkham. Get in the car, Harvey. As they drive away, Two-Face says every damned day he's at war trying to keep his secret. A war of attrition between himself and Two-Face. He doesn't know Bruce Wayne is Batman, only Harvey Dent does. And he doesn't know how much longer he can keep it from his more twisted half. He's trying so hard to keep Two-Face locked away in his mind, and that's why he came here, to do some good before he sees him and drags him into the dark. Two-Face begins to slam his cuffs into his head, and as he does, the wound above his eye begins to pulsate. Batman tells him that Harvey Dent is stronger than Two-Face. I believe that. Fight, damn it! Bury Two-Face for what he's done! As Batman stops by the courthouse, Two-Face asks, Why are we here? This isn't Arkham. And Batman tells him that his alter ego is planning something and he's going to find out what it is. As Batman jumps out, he locks the Batmobile with Two-Face still in it. Two-Face tells him that he doesn't want to be locked up. He starts to smack his head with the cuffs again and then slams his head against the dash, shouting that he can protect Gotham. He can lead his disciples however he chooses. He can keep Two-Face locked away. The scales of justice will be balanced and his destiny will finally be revealed. But as Batman finds a hidden passage to the lower parts of the courthouse, Two-Face manages to activate the passenger eject sequence, rocketing into the roof of the car. He begins to crawl out of the side asking, what the hell am I doing in his car? The ejector seat impact against the canopy didn't break his neck, but it damn well took off the cuffs and woke up Two-Face. But if his car and cuffs are there, then Batman is very close. It's high time they shared a few words between old friends. Back inside, Batman is quietly creeping through the old underground passageways left behind in the old days of Gotham when he finds a set of large wooden doors. The torches around light the way as Batman pushes them open, and when he does, he sees a group of people wearing the same outfits as the thugs earlier, all of them chanting, Two of us! Two of us! But just then, the quiet ting of a coin flip silences everything. And as it lands on Tails, Two-Face says, It's like music to my ears, Batman. He begins to fire multiple times into Batman's chest until finally, Batman falls. After being knocked out, Batman slowly comes to as he hears Two-Face talking to his disciples. And the ting, as the coin is flipped. Two-Face catches it, slapping it on the back of his hand, telling everyone that Vice will head out tonight with his brothers. His directive is to do no good. He then turns to Batman and tells him that truly good and bad can only be fully experienced when you truly understand each other. My disciples and I are here to teach Gotham just that, and in turn, we are going to build a stronger city. It is better to see your dark angel in its true light rather than masking it. And to truly understand, we can go half seas, plain and simple. A renewal is called for, old friend, a baptism of body and mind! As Batman hangs suspended sideways over a vat of bubbling acid, he responds. Our dark nature doesn't need to be rubbed in our faces each and every day. The war that you are waging with your inner demons is a losing battle. Two-Face flips the coin, telling him, One way or another, there's always a winner. And in the midst of chaos, there's always an opportunity. As the coin comes down, it comes up tails, and Two-Face tells him, Let the baptism begin! The crank begins to turn, and Batman's body is slowly lowered into the chemicals, but the acid burns away at the ropes that are keeping him up, and he falls in. Using the spikes on his gauntlet, he fires them out into the bottom of the vat, puncturing three holes, giving himself just the right amount of time to pull himself back up. As the acid floods onto the floor, the disciples begin to scream and they shout, and Two-Face yells, Damn him! Damn him! He begins to climb up on top of everyone to reach the higher levels of the church, but Batman makes his way out and over. Two-Face turns back, firing his gun, shouting, You dare destroy the sanctity of my church! Batman takes out his grappling gun, shooting an anchor into the wall by Two-Face, and then one behind him telling him, Everyone on the floor, grab a hold of the wire! Use it to save your miserable lives! Using the taunt wiring, Batman uses it to bounce himself higher and escape, while Two-Face and the followers are left to help themselves. Later outside, Vice begins to set the explosive charges to the new extension of the children's hospital, telling himself, do no good. 
One of the disciples says that if they blow this, it'll hit the kids, and Vice tells him, It doesn't matter. I don't have a choice anymore. The man tells him that he does, but Vice kicks him off the ledge. It was a choice to die, and I made the right one. At that moment, Batman, still with his suit halfway burned from the acid, kicks Vice, telling him, If your choice was to get your head beaten in, then you made the right choice. After tying Vice up and securing him, Batman tells him, I'm going to remove the tape from your mouth, and you're going to tell me a story of how you met Harvey Dent. Once his mouth is freed, Vice tells him that he and Versa were living on the streets when they heard a gunshot from a nearby apartment. They went over there and found Two-Face and a lot of money. Two-Face had shot himself in the head, yet he was somehow still alive. A few days passed while they were trying to figure out what to do when the Joker literally came kicking in the door, and he told them that he was going to save Two-Face, but he needed their help to get him where they needed to go. What they didn't know was that instead of removing the slug, Joker had Hugo Strange drill into Two-Face's head to attach a small device to the bullet made by the Mad Hatter. Something about making him jump. He'll get some new ideas and bouts of memory loss. Also, the Joker was going to make Two-Face into a pawn, into some game that he was setting up. After that, Joker insisted that he and Versa help Two-Face form his church and go along with whatever plan he came up with. Meanwhile, elsewhere, the Joker is toiling away underground, mining into stone, when he finally gives up, tossing a stick of dynamite at it. He covers his ears as the explosion goes off and the dust settles and two giant owls slump over, revealing an inner chamber. Joker laughs. laughs. Dent may have been an early draft pick, but it looks like I just got myself a new recruit. Back up on the streets, Batman goes back to the underground church to try and find Two-Face, but finds that he has already escaped. But what's really unsettling is what Vice said about Two-Face's position in all of this with Joker, Strange, and the Mad Hatter all being involved with Dent's current state of mind or lack thereof. A few hours later, Batman heads to his first stop, the apartment of Hugo Strange. He crashes into it, shouting, Where is Dent? And Strange charges in, swinging. After breaking an arm and knocking Strange to the ground, Batman yells again, Where is he, Strange? And without getting any answers, a Mad Hatter smiles. Oh, poor Hugo. So delusional. Always thinking that he can take you in a fair fight. However, the real thing is, who has Batman really helped? Who has he saved? Who does he fight for? As Batman's mind is flooded with the people in his life, the ones that he has helped, the ones that he has lost, he steadies his mind for a moment and punches. The illusions all fade and he tells the Mad Hatter, there's no hiding behind the people that I care about. With the Hatter knocked out, Batman turns back to the knocked out Hugo Strange. Sorry, but it looks like your friend is unconscious, so we're gonna pick up where we left off. Where's Dent? Strange laid out in detail the manipulation of the bullet in Dent's brain and the microchip locator he attached to it. The signal is now coming from inside the Gotham Police Armory, and as Batman arrives, he sees the knocked out guards and turns calling out that it's over and that his good half is trying to break through. Don't let the Joker control him like a chess piece for the war that he is waging in. But at that moment, just then, Two-Face steps out wearing a large mechanical bat suit, telling him, no one is controlling me but myself, Batman. As the helmet snaps shut, he runs full force, tackling into Batman, aiming straight for the wall. Batman tries to reach for the main circuit board, but Two-Face slams him into the wall again, getting ready to punch him even further. As the panels fall, Batman jumps out of the way, and Two-Face shouts, Where did you go? There's no hiding, Bats! Batman pops back up, holding a rocket launcher, firing it into Two-Face's helmet, telling him, I am trying to save you! As the smoke clears, Batman sees a crack in the helmet and he reaches into it to open it up more, slamming a small device into Two-Face's forehead. The device then activates and Harvey yells out in pain. My head! My head! What did you do, Batman? Batman tells him that he's trying to keep a promise and, but before he could finish, an owl with razor sharp claws shoots by. Batman and Two-Face turn back to see the owl fly to the arm of one of the court of the owl's talons, Lincoln March. Once that owl's perched, Lincoln looks at the two of them. Hello. The Joker sends his regards. Batman groans, telling Harvey that this is another of the Joker's pieces in his arsenal. He has got a choice to make. Pick a side. Do you want to be a puppet on a string like these talons? Harvey yells, The Joker can go to hell and take his damn owls with him. That's the side I'm on. 
Versa yells that they heard the master, and Vice shouts to the Church of Two that they have aligned to the bat. Show no mercy. Harvey begins to shoot while shouting, The Joker wants me! He can come and get me! Batman begins to battle against Lincoln, telling him, Rumor has it the Court of the Owls had enough not being able to control you, so they buried you in the Tomb of the Unworthy, with all of the other worthless talents. That is where you're mistaken! I have a mission, a very important one, and that mission is to kill you! While they begin their battle, Joker watches the video feed from the Talon's comlinks telling him, Oh, this is going to be fun! I have a front row seat to the madcap mayhem! Oh, the magic of the modern technology! Batman and Lincoln go back and forth exchanging blows, but Harvey stands up telling him, It looks like we're fighting together like we used to. One puts them down, the other puts them behind bars, just like the old days. The old days weren't always that good, but they weren't that bad either. So if you're holding back, don't, Harvey. Harvey begins to unload all of his weapons, telling him, Understood. But Batman turns back to Lincoln, dodging the attacks, telling him that his attacks are off. Maybe he should have stayed buried and asleep because he's woken into a nightmare. Batman grabs Lincoln by the head, slamming him into his knee, cracking the Talon mask, and Lincoln gets back up laughing and punching Batman down. He begins to swing over and over and over, until finally Batman reaches up, grabbing him by the mouth, telling him, THAT IS ENOUGH! Before Lincoln could push him back, Batman activates one of Freeze's cold pellets, freezing him in place. Two-Face yells that there are too many of them. Everyone get out of here! Your faith in me wasn't deserved! And Batman calls out, I have an idea. Lead the Talons towards me. Two-Face tells him, no, I have a plan. Go now. So Harvey begins to unload all of the rockets with the blast knocking him down as Vice and Versa check on him. Two-Face regains control of Harvey's body, shouting, Were you a part of this? Were my own disciples betraying me, trying to destroy me? But suddenly, Two-Face can't move, and he asks, What did you do? Batman tells him, I paralyzed you by shutting down the suit. We need to perform surgery. And with you wearing a prototype suit seized by the GCPD, it's making for a good operating table. The blast from the rockets causes the bullet lodged in his brain to shift and he's back to being Two-Face instead of Harvey. This has to end. So Batman takes out a small drill and slowly begins to enter the hole in Two-Face's skull, watching through his cowl to make sure he doesn't miss. Hang on, just a bit further, Harvey. The drill extends out its prongs, latching onto the bullet and slowly beginning to retract until finally it's removed. The next night in Blackgate prison with the entire event over, Joker's plans spoiled, the Talons defeated, Harvey back in control, he's sitting in his cell looking over a book telling him, The statute is pretty clear. Next time that you meet with your lawyer, give him these notes. The inmate outside tells him, Thank you so much. Here's some smokes for your help. Harvey turns them down, and the guard tells him, Come on, your 15 is up. Next. The next inmate takes a seat smiling, and Harvey tells him to go ahead and paint him a picture of the case and where he can help. The inmate says that he remembers him throwing the book at him, and Harvey tells him, that he is just a jailhouse lawyer looking to help the guys in here who didn't get a square deal. So the inmate places a small object on the bars of the cell. As he walks off, he tells him that it's a gift from an old friend. And outside, Batman removes the mask of the inmate that he was impersonating, firing his grappling hook to leave the prison. It was a late night in Gotham City as Detective Richard Godis drives through Gleason's self-storage. He tells the others on the phone that he's pulling in now, the deposits being made. But as he pulls up, the sound of a horse galloping can be heard. And an eerie voice stating, Evening, detective. Or should I say, retired. Richard turns back asking who could this be? But he quickly realizes it's someone who should be dead. Before Richard has a chance, the ghost of Jack Holman rides up telling him, so are you! And he shoots Richard's right hand. The next day, the GCPD holds a funeral for Richard, which many high-profile people attend, including Bruce Wayne. Bruce begins to look around, trying to piece things together. Bruce had an open file on Rich since he was a beat cop, always in the know, always on the edges of big busts with big cash drops that drug lords later claimed were skimmed. Gotis had a talent for flying under the radar, but now he's dead, and his killer is still on the loose. With this many high-profile attendees, something tells Bruce that Gotis's death is only the beginning of something bigger. He begins to listen in on conversations with his earpiece, when he catches some detectives telling Commissioner Bullock that they appreciate him for his discretion. Bullock says that he only did this for the kids and the department. No need to make it a freak show. 
Another group of detectives then state that the deposit was confirmed, but his head was cut clean off. That didn't sit right with Bruce. So later that night, after everyone had gone to bed, he put on the bat suit and headed to the grave. With the help of Mr. Terrific, Batman had a new tool to help x-ray his surroundings. Might not be as good as Superman's x-ray vision, but it should be fine. He scans the grave to see Richard's body and notices two things. One, the gunshot wound to the hand. Second, his head was cut off. His spine was severed between the C1 and C2 vertebrae. He then goes to the police department to try and find more clues in the case when he pulls out the bullet found in Richard's hand. That bullet came from a .357 Service 6 revolver. Only some of the old timers still carry revolvers instead of the department issued Glock. Time for him to dig deeper. Over the next two days, two more people were killed by the ghost of Jack Holman, the second being a judge. Batman goes over to the scene of Hurwitz's murder, looking at the missing floorboard stating that his living situation seems to have dramatically changed. He's told of Hurwitz's divorce a year ago, and Bullock tells Batman that he catches flack every time that there is a bat trampling over his crime scenes he needs to get out of here. Batman gets up telling him, the time for hiding is past. Any more details about these two similar murders? Bullock asks, how did you get out of here? Next time, I'm gonna tell the officers to shoot to kill if you walk back behind the tape again. Batman jumps out of the window. No, you won't. With three people now dead, another detective talks on the phone that it doesn't take a math whiz to figure out that they are the last ones. They got too greedy. He's going to head out of town for a bit. He might want to do the same. The detective then gets on his motorcycle leaving, but while taking some of the back roads, he hears the clopping of a galloping horse. He looks back to see Jack. You! But as Jack swings his sword, the man's head falls off. And Jack tells him, Us! Later, the man the detective was talking to grills some burgers for his family when he gets a call. Startled by his phone vibrating, he spins around with his gun. When no one is there, he grabs the phone answering. Jack tells him that he will soon get word that one of his musketeers had a motorcycle accident, which is why he hasn't been answering. Come to the GCPD mounted unit stables in an hour. Bring the DAT tapes. The detective tells him that he doesn't have them, but Jack tells him, nice family. Don't let the burgers overcook. As the hour passes, the detective quietly walks into the stables where Jack is pointing a gun, telling him, punctual, one admirable trait for a worthless human being. The detective says that he can't be Jack. So if he's going to die, just who the hell is he? Jack tells him his name is Stephen Holman. Jack's son. His dad discovered four trusted officials were at the top of a dirty machine stealing and selling drugs after putting the screws into one of Gotham's biggest drug lords. Internal Affairs scooped his dad from the mounted unit and had him get closer. Make them all believe that he was their hatchet man while wearing a wire. But they had an Internal Affairs officer on payroll, and his dad was ratted out. They forced him to turn over the tapes and kill himself. On top of that, they planted drugs on him in a suicide note to make sure he looked like a dirty cop. The detective says that he knows. He was the one who wrote the story. And the shotgun? Steven says, no quick, clean stroke for you. I'm going to use the same 12 gauge that you put into my dad's hands to blow off his own head but not before he steps over, putting the tapes into the saddlebag. As the detective does as he's told, Stephen takes the tape, playing it to hear his father's voice. And the detective says, look, I can disappear. No one will know where I am. And But Stephen stops him picking up the shotgun. But up in the rafters, Batman has heard enough, throwing batarangs into Stephen's arm. The detective jumps for the shotgun, but Batman tells him, don't you touch it. The detective still goes for it, so Batman lets loose several tasers knocking the man out. Steven begins to run away, but Batman gets up on one of the horses, quickly chasing after him. Batman yells for him to stop, but Steven says that he won't stop until his father's name is clear. Steven makes a turn for the terminal, riding through the crowded halls, but Batman shouts, You're putting innocent people in danger! Steven turns back, firing his gun, and I will finish what I started! Once Batman is in range, Batman throws a batarang to stop him from shooting. But then he fires the grappling hook, pulling Steven off of the horse. Batman hops down from his horse, telling him, Your midnight rides come to an end. Steven looks up, begging him. Vet the tapes. Make sure the city learns that his dad was a hero, not a dirty cop. And Batman tells him, Your father's story was tragic. 
but he was willing to do the right thing even if people didn't know it. The lives you took, you dishonored his legacy. So the next morning, Bruce waits for his coffee to be made as he reads the paper, and then he hears news over his tablet. He looks up to see Mayor Nakano announce to the people of Gotham that he wishes to rid the city of the masked and dangerous once and for all, and for him to do that, to, to save the city that they all love, he will wear the mask of a mayor to do it. People gather around a man in a reflective mask as he tells everyone that he believes in the citizens of Gotham. The citizens who are tired of the bats and the cats and the clowns who leap around their city as if the law does not apply to them. For far too long, the so-called heroes have been allowed to run amok in the name of protecting, when maybe the only thing they should truly be protecting is their own right to step out of the shadows. Even the recently wounded police officer Nakano, who's now running for mayor, is using the unmask war cry as his main platform. If their voice is to be heard above the white noise of a campaign, they need to recruit. They need to expand and turn their grassroots movement into a wall of sanity. Now surely some of you are asking why I am wearing a mask. I'm not hiding who I am. I'm showing everyone who they are because I am the mirror. I am you, you are me, and we are Gotham. I don't want one face to represent our revolution because then the media and the politicians will focus on a single person and shine a light onto each and every little human frailty. I want this city to see all of our faces. The mirror pulls on a chain revealing a wall of Bat Family masks stating, you are the revolution and we won't rest until the identities of these masked protectors of Gotham are laid bare. Our mission is to hunt them down on our own streets and roofs. From this moment forward, we are the gargoyle hunters. After a day of packing, Batman decides to clear his head and go out on patrol. Because if there's one thing that he can always count on, there's criminals who need to be stopped. As he makes his way downtown, a group of bank robbers flee by while shooting at officers when Batman races in on his motorcycle. Helicopter follows up, calling out to the robbers that they need to stop the vehicle and release the hostages at once. Batman speeds up to the robbers, pull over, but across the street, a masked person with a rifle fires a small explosive. The rocket hits Batman's front wheel, forcing him to jump off, and the robbers laugh. Ha ha! Looks like someone smoked a bat for us! But what they don't see is in the air, Batman has fired his grappling hook into the back of the getaway car and he is skidding behind them. The robbers lean out shooting at him to try and knock him off, but Batman hits the retract button, flinging himself forward, grabbing a hold of the roof. He rips the door off, telling them, you might not have heard me, I said pull over. He reaches in grabbing the driver, throwing him out, jumping into the driver's seat to steer while the robbers in the back begin to shoot at the back of his head. He tells them, Doing that at such close range makes me mad. He grabs the lever to lower his seat, pointing the tips of his ears at the two of them, firing them into their arms. After finally stopping the car, he pulls his detachable ears from the robber's arms. These belong to me. Soon everyone begins to cheer, but then they start to ask him a simple question. They want the Batman to unmask himself. Without even answering, Batman aims his grappling hook and he escapes thinking that the anti-vigilante sentiment seems to be gaining momentum. To get to the root of this, he might have to switch tactics and give Batman a rest and let Bruce Wayne do some work for once. So later that night, Bruce Wayne attends a fundraiser for Nakano on a yacht where he gives a speech thanking everyone here for supporting his campaign because he certainly wouldn't have been able to cover a jet ski on a patrolman's salary. But in all seriousness, he'd like to paint the picture of who he was and how he got here and why he's running for mayor of Gotham City. For too long, the innocent people have been caught in the crossfire of this vigilante war, made worse by the theatrics of those who have worn costumes and called themselves heroes. The night that he lost his eye and his partner was because of the war that the Joker was waging. And that was the night that he gained the confidence to ask himself one simple question. What was he prepared to do to continue serving the city that he was born in? The answer came to him more easily than he thought run for mayor and officially push for an end to the senseless vigilantes battling once and for all. After his speech was over, many of the guests came up to congratulate him for running, but some of the security on deck began to get taken out one by one. And while Nakano talks to some of the attendees, a man calls out, EVENING! A group of men in scuba gear climb on and the man continues, NO ONE HAS TO WORRY ABOUT THEIR LIVES AS LONG AS YOU COOPERATE. 
The quicker you place your money and valuables into the waterproof bag, the quicker I and my men will be gone, and you can contact your insurance companies. Any hesitations or heroics will be met with violence. As everyone begins to take off their jewelry, Bruce Wayne presses a button on his watch and quietly sneaks to the glass fruit display. He palms an apple, stating, Hopefully no one does anything stupid. And at that moment, Nakano tries to wrestle the gun from one of the men. With everyone distracted, Batman throws the glass apple at the gunman holding the captain hostage. The yacht does a sharp turn, knocking everyone to the ground. And as Bruce fights off the men attacking Nakano, right on cue, Nightwing drops down from his glider. Ahoy, mateys! Heard there was a pirate problem! Once Nightwing takes out the rest of the pirates, he checks on everyone to make sure that they're okay as Bruce hands Nakano back his eye patch. Nakano points out that his missing eye says that this is the cost of masks. Sometimes it's an eye, or a leg, or an arm, and sometimes it's even a life. Damn all masks. The good and the bad feed off each other in a vicious, never-ending cycle. Nightwing looks back over. Uh, okay. And on that happy note, you're welcome. After the yacht is brought back to the docks, Bruce heads down to the Batcave when he notices his chair isn't angled at four o'clock like he leaves it. Someone was looking for something. He then reaches for his black casebook, and when he opens it, he sees that the pages are blank. There's only one person other than Alfred who knew where this was locked, who knew how to get into this location undetected. So what's your next move? Damien. Nakano could see nothing but fire when he hears a voice calling out to him. It shouldn't have been me! It should have been you, Nakano! It's your skin that should be cooking in the flames, your flesh! Nakano yells back, it wasn't my fault! I didn't know the flood was booby-trapped! Nakano's partner, Bart says that he let him go through the door first. That he wanted him to be the hero, he wanted to save him. But he didn't, he let him burn. And he gets to have a beautiful wife, a great apartment, and a job that he loves. The city's respect, the city's pity! I hope it was worth it, partner. Just then there's another voice. There you are, finally found you. Looking for this, Officer Nakano? Through the flames, Nakano sees Batman holding his eye. Nakano screams, waking from his nightmare. His wife holds him, telling him to shush, it's okay. It was just a bad dream. And he says that he watched Bart burn and he couldn't do anything to save him. And she tells him that it wasn't his fault. The city was at war and he's lucky to have. He screams again, punching and breaking the decorative masks over their bed, shouting, Survived? It's these masks and what they represent. Secrets, lies, the good guys, the bad guys running around Gotham like it's their own private circus. She grabs him and says that maybe he should reassess running for mayor. After everything that's happened, the stress and the pressure, it's just too high. He tells her that that is exactly why he has to run. This is a fight that he has to win, not just for Gotham, but for their child that is on the way. They fight together for his future more than theirs. Meanwhile, elsewhere, Batman holds up the torn Robin symbol ripped from Damien's costume, thinking that it all started with this. He tore the symbol off his chest like it was burning a hole in him, and he said he would never wear it again. Relief and determination etched on his face. The R was a burden. The R was an anchor. The R was holding him back. And without hesitation, he walked away, his days of Robin being over. He planned on giving Damien all the space that he needed to rethink his decision. But for some reason, he decided to clip all of the security measures in the cave and steal Batman's Book of Secrets. The last remnant of his unsolved casework, the Black Casebook. The irony, of course, is that he only had just rescued the book from the Joker's clutches, only to have his own son take it from him. Damien is on a mission to prove something, and he wants him to see each and every move, just like he wanted him to feel every blow in that fight in front of the Teen Titans. Damien knows how important the casebook is, so he's got him looking for him. Guess he shouldn't be surprised. Nothing new to a 13-year-old boy pushing his father away with one hand while reaching out to keep that relationship alive with the other. While the Teen Titans watched, Damien got angrier for each punch and kick that he didn't answer back with. And deep down, Damien knew that he couldn't make his own father fight back. He had hopes that Damien would be rational, consistent, less self-absorbed. A father's great expectations need to be tempered from time to time. But there's one thing that he learned from the entire Teen Titans and Robin situation. It's that if Damien doesn't want to be found, he won't be. That is an uphill battle for another time because right now he has to focus on why this emergency meeting was called. He lands on the rooftop with the other members of the Bat family, Red Hood stating, The gang's all here. Batman looks around asking if anyone's seen Robin, and they look at themselves stating, No. All right, first things first. There's been an uptick with this anti-vigilante crowd. Putting down bad guys is getting harder and harder by the day. 
That woman says that she's running into the same thing, interference at every turn. Crude, but efficient. Everyone else tells their stories of their run-ins, but at the end of it, Signal tells them, great, we're patrolling a city that's been targeting us. Nightwing says they need to get ahead of this. Diffuse this growing grassroots group by convincing them that they are not the bad people simply because they wear masks. Batman then says that it's going to be tough. They all saw the recent optics. Even after the boat rescue, Nakano is still hitting the anti-vigilante platform hard. You could see the righteous fury in his eyes. It's a bell Nakano will continue to ring long after if he wins. Signal Sai stating that he's glad that Batman calls these meetings. At least he isn't the only one dealing with this. And Batman stares for a moment. I didn't call this meeting. Nightwing did. And Nightwing chimes in. No, I didn't. Everyone looks at each other for an answer and Orphan yells, Below! When they all look over, the gargoyle hunters begin to storm the building with a mirror leading the charge, chanting, No more bats! No more bats! While the Bat family handle that, though, elsewhere, Damien begins to go through Batman's casebook of all of his unsolved cases against Bruce Wayne. Many of them were simple things, car bombings that went off too soon, poison on the vegetables in the garden from the manor, scuba tanks mixed with nitrogen. However, there was something else. As Damien hangs upside down in the GCPD cold file room, he looks at his father's cases and looks at the detective signing off on the reports. There's a name that appears on every report. Damien scoffs, stating that the old man must be getting slow. Less than a weekend and he's already got a suspect. Let's go say hello to Detective Catherine Podolsky. Across the town, the lights go out on Econo's campaign office as he tells his wife that he'll just be another hour and he'll be home. Yes, love you too. He sighs as he hangs up when a voice tells him that he'll never realize just how hard it is to run for office at first. Nakano yells who's there, and Mira steps out telling him that he's coming bearing gifts. The gun that he is looking for is in his hand. But as for who he is, he is the Mirror, the man who took his gun and could deliver him the election. Nakano grabs the gun telling him, I have no interest in it being delivered to me. Mira goes on telling him that this flash drive has quite a bit to offer. But first, he'd like to invite him to a front row position at a special event that he has planned. It'll help shine a light on a future vigilante list Gotham. Nakano stands up telling Mira that he is just another mask. Why would he stand with someone who goes against his beliefs? And Mira leans in so that Nakano can see his own reflection. I am you. We are one and the same. As I told my brother in this mask, it gives my message clarity. I will happily remove it once my work is done. So come, stand with me. Nakano tells him no. He will not be a focal point for the event. He also will not be using whatever is on this drive to sling mud. He'd rather lose than win that way. So take it, because he's not even going to be putting his fingerprints on it or downloading it to his computer. Mira picks up the drive and begins to walk out telling him, You will lose this election. Remember that. Meanwhile, at the apartment of Catherine Podonsky, she walks in setting her badge and gun down when she notices that her cat's food bowl is still full. She walks through the dark apartment asking where is her beautiful little girl, mommy's home and, and as she flips on the light, Damien is sitting in a chair petting the cat. Don't worry, Cleo's very comfortable at the moment. Catherine yells, you need to get out of here before, but Damien stops her. You'll do no such thing. However, you will tell me about your involvement with all of the attempts of murder on young Bruce Wayne. That was pure happenstance that I landed the lead on a lot of those cases. Damien tells her, no, not some all of them. You also happen to be the only detective to survive since then. We both know that this is more than luck, don't we, Catherine? Elliot. The same Catherine Elliot who is the half-sister to the father of a notorious criminal mastermind, aka Thomas Elliot. But it was a rather sordid affair that was swept under the rug. The same Catherine Elliot who made many demands until she was finally cut off when Tommy discovered your existence. The same Catherine Elliot who was more than willing to accept secret wired cash payments to help little Tommy's plans by signing off on the cases as unsolved. So what you're going to do now is walk right up to the precinct and turn yourself in. Catherine asks him, where is your evidence that I'm related to Hush? What makes you think that I'll listen to you? You're just a kid wearing a disguise pretending to be a superhero. And Damien taunts her. You're the one wearing the disguise of a cop and a detective. And unfortunately, you're not good at either. She grabs her gun telling him that there is no way in hell that she is turning herself in and destroying all the years that she put into this badge. Even if she has to shoot a kid? Damien snatched the gun away from her scoffing. I've gone toe-to-toe -to -toe with my mom, who by the way, used to lead the League of Assassins. After tying Catherine up, 
He tells her that her fellow cop should be here soon, and they'll get the evidence that he left behind, and don't worry, he'll find a good home for Cleo. Back out on the streets, the Bat family all begin seeing the crowds of protesters march through the city. They all seem to be heading into the same direction, to the large protest that Mira has staged beneath them. In the middle of the flash mob, Mira is yelling out, We are the wave of sanity! And this is our time to grow. If you're tired of feeling helpless and scared and worthless, this is your moment. It's time to draw out the masks, the good, the bad, the ugly. We want our city back. Gotham will thrive and grow once the vigilantes are extinct. And if the extinction had to come as a result of some violence, so be it. But we must act and act now. No sleep until all of the masks are on a pyre of transparency, myself included. Now come. But as Mira leads his followers through the city, they run into a group of people who are all wearing masks, and he asks, Who the hell are you supposed to be? One man says that they are here to show that there is a large percentage of Gotham that knows how necessary heroes have been. The monsters that they've kept at bay, the sheer number of souls that they have saved over the years. So they are here to say that the heroes have to stay. Mira walks up to the man speaking and punches him. You are too blind to see, so maybe you won't need your eyes. A riot breaks out, and Batman and the others quickly jump in to help stop it, but something about the brawl feels off. When suddenly, the family is the target of the attacks, including the protesters wearing the masks. Batman charges at Mira, telling him, This ends now! Whoever you are, we're not going to let you hold the city hostage with psychos! Mira punches Batman back, shouting, me and my hunters are here for the same! The two exchange blows. Though Mirror is lacking in skill, he manages to become formidable. As Batman kicks him back, Mira hops off the ledge overlooking the river, telling him, I have an idea now, an idea that is stronger than flesh. Batman yells for him to get back. If he jumps, the currents will! But Mira turns and leaps, shouting, when there's a beating, I'll be there. When vigilantism comes to an end, I'll be there. All true missions need a martyr. Batman runs to the ledge, but when he looks over, he sees an explosion of smoke and Mira disappears. Many of the protesters begin to shout that Batman killed Mira. Batman looks back asking, Can't you see after all of this time? We fight for Gotham! When I was younger, forces beyond my control, forces that were allowed to grow and fester by corrupt institutions, failed me. They destroyed my life. I put on this mask to prevent that from happening to others. These people joined me. They were failed too, and they see the help the same as I do. We don't look for or want thanks. We do it because this is our city, our community. We wear masks not to protect ourselves, but to protect the lives of others, our families, friends, and associates. We fight for them and this city because we hope that one day we won't be needed at all. So please go home. But at that moment, Batman gets a call from Nightwing telling him that they're making their way through the crowd and they will wrap things up. Elsewhere, Hush is pointing a gun at Batgirl's head. Batman asks, are you sure? And Nightwing tells him, yeah, we'll go over the after action report later. Hush reaches over, pulling the earpiece from Nightwing's ear, telling him, what a wonderfully motivated performance. You will no longer need your comm link, Nightwing. Consider yourself disconnected and lucky enough to see another day. Now sleep, little Nightwing. He tranks him, knocking him out, and then he lets him fall with all the others. A short while later, the captured members begin to hear clicking sounds and someone speaking. Hush holsters his gun. I'm happy to see everyone finally awake. As I look at all of you, an old quote from an old Greek poem comes to mind. Youth is easily deceived because it is quick to hope. The old Greeks were so very right. Because I was once like you. I thought if I worked hard, had a fixed goal, visualized everything down to the smallest detail, then it would all go according to plan. Well, I was wrong. Hope really is for fools. And since I am a man of science, a surgeon even, you'd think that I'd always understand that idea. But unfortunately, we so tend to be blind ourselves at times to the most obvious. I'll be drawing some blood from each of you so that I can know your organs and other various body parts to find the right people who are in need of donations. King Harvest will surely come. And this is one family that Bruce won't be able to put back together again. But while Hush begins his preparations, Batman is on the hunt for Damien in his stolen casebook, assuming that Nightwing and the others are going to meet up with them later. The computer finally came back with a match for a tiny piece of paper found on the floor. Decades old paper from a specific stock of paper made only for a decades old specific event, the Gotham World's Fair. 
Batman flies up to the old towers, sneaking into the roof, and when he gets inside, he can see that this place was turned into a base of operations and living quarters. The windows have been coated with a special film, which allows Damien to see out while no one can see in, which explains why there were no infrared signatures. Batman looks over and he can see the casebook under a pillow, and he picks it up and sees several photos fall out. He sorts the photos and notices that they are all pictures of Alfred. Damien is suffering after the death of Alfred. Alfred was much more of a father to Damien than... But before Batman thinks about the sad thoughts, he turns when suddenly he is struck by a kick to the chest and Damien shouts, LEAVE MY STUFF ALONE! He continues swinging and Batman pushes him back telling him, I came to talk, but clearly that won't be happening. Your powers of perception continue to amaze me, father! He throws several small rocks at him, but Batman shields himself telling him, The only powers I seem to have is feeding your anger. But if you're trying to keep your distance, then why did you come for my book? You have nothing to prove to me, son. Damien doesn't answer, lunging at him, and Batman catches the punch, telling him, You are my son, and I love you, but sometimes I truly don't like you because of some of the choices that you've made. Now sit down! He grabs Damien by the head, forcibly putting him down, but Damien wraps his legs around Batman's neck, throwing him back out the window, and the two tumble out onto the next building and finally to the ground. Damien groans and Batman coughs, asking, Are you finally done taking swings at me? And Damien scoffs. Probably not. Later at the hospital, the doctor polishes a prosthetic eye, telling him that he's almost done, and he's ready for the insertion. Mr. Nakano puts in the eye, taking off his eye patch, but he decides that the eye patch makes him feel stronger, gives him confidence, makes him feel like someone else. It gives him the freedom of amenity, as if he was wearing a mask. But as he decides that he'll take the prosthetic eye, the doctor tells him that it's the best that Mr. Wayne could buy. Mr. Nakano is furious. He rips the eye out and he demands to know why. The doctor tells him that Mr. Wayne insisted that the accident happened on his property. But Nakano freaks out, stating that he will not let the rich control his decisions if he becomes mayor. He will not be bought. And he smashes it, getting up and leaving. But back with Batman, the two work together when they realize that their argument means nothing when their signals are dead. Everyone is gone and missing. No sign of them since the fight with Mirror. Damien may hate him, but at least he listened long enough to understand that the rest of the Bat family needs the help of Batman and Damien. Over with Hush, he puts on his surgical gloves, telling them that he is happy to have found a unique way to dismantle Batman's family, to make millions of dollars at the same time. He'll be using chloroform instead of the regular anesthesia. As a surgeon, not his preference, of course, but it's incredibly difficult to secure the anesthesia cart without leaving a paper trail. He places the chloroform soak rag over Red Hood's face, telling him, You may not be completely under, but it should be enough to keep you from feeling any real pain. But outside, Batman swings in, telling him, This is it. The two fling themselves forward, Damien telling him, Finally, let's do this. At that moment, Batman and Damien crash through the window, with Batman yelling for him to stand down. Hush turns back, pointing his gun, telling him, your detective skills continue to amaze me. I was going to destroy you with a thousand cuts by taking your family piece by piece, but maybe killing you today with all of them around is better. As Batman and Damien duck from the oncoming fire, Damien tells him, I'll strike high. And Batman tells him, no, the others down there need us. Get them out of the line of fire. I'll distract them. Hush continues to run up the stairs yelling, you can't hide from me. I'm going to blow that balcony apart. Batman gets up charging and telling Damien to go, and once he's close enough to hush, he swings shouting, Damn you! You know what's been taken, and now you threaten my family! My family! Down below, Damien checks Nightwing's pulse, asking if he can hear him. Nightwing groans, and Damien tells him it's okay. They're going to get him out of here, he promises that. But back upstairs, Hush cracks Batman in the mouth with the butt of his gun yelling, What the hell makes you think I care about your family, when I didn't even care about my own? While the Wayne's deaths paved a road of gold, my parents found ways to keep me off of it for as long as they needed. My mother didn't even have the common courtesy to die when I cut her brake lines. Hush grabs Batman's face, continuing to squeeze so hard that Batman begins to lose feeling. When suddenly Hush screams as dozens of scalpels are thrown into his back. When he looks back, he says, that brat's a bit more brutal than the other apples. And Batman rubs his face. I'd personally go with fierce. Damien throws another fistful of scalpels, telling him, And I thought the pinhead look worked, but the porcupine works much better. 
Hush shields himself with his arm, yelling in pain, telling him, I'm going to take each of these scalpels in. But Damien punches him in the face. You'll do nothing, freak. As Damien continues his assault, he says that he found out more about his half-sister and his sick plot to murder his father when he was a boy. He convinced Catherine to turn herself in. And after he rearranges his face, he'll need even more bandages before he turns himself in too. But suddenly Damien feels himself pulled back as a battering pins him back by his hood. Batman yells, I appreciate the breather, but surely you can understand. This is personal. Batman throws himself into Hush, and the two fall to the floor below. As they stand back up, Batman removes his cape and gloves and readies himself for a one-on-one -on -one fight. The two take turns punching into each other, one after another, all while Batman remembers back when they were younger and how they got to this point. Batman swings with one powerful right hook, knocking Hush to the ground, telling him, We were once young friends who turned into enemies, but it's too late to change a damn thing. Batman pulls his arm back again to swing but then he hears clapping. He looks back to see his son clapping for him. Well done, father, well done. Batman asks if the others are safe and Damien tells him that they are fine, slowly coming out of the chloroform haze. He focuses back on Hush, securing him. I'd like to finish our conversation, Ed. But then he looks back to see Damien is already gone. Outside, Damien is getting ready to leave and Batman stops him. Where are you going? I solved the first case in your black book. And one day, when you're gone, in your memory, the last one will be solved. We still have a lot to talk about, son. Damien takes off his mask. Everything's been said that needs to be said. As I told you before, there's a giant shadow that follows me. The size of the shadow doesn't mean anything. It's about the person you are inside that hunk of flesh and bones. I thought about everything that we've been through that would be understood. Damien turns. See, I thought you'd have understood me by now. I was never as patient as you. Our formative years were quite different. Our die was cast by the fate of the families that we were born into. I tried following your path, father. I thought maybe I could perfect it, but I was wrong. I've been wrong about so much, and after losing Alfred, Batman reaches out telling him, Alfred was a soldier, the very best. His death was not something that you should take blame for. Maybe, but I do blame myself. Nothing you say can change my mind. It's something I have to live with. Before Damien can fully leave, Batman holds out the Robin pin. This is yours. And Damien looks at it. No, it's yours. And he leaves. The next day, the polls finally close and everyone gathers around to watch as the ballots are closed. The news reports that Nakano has won. There are cheers roaring in the campaign office. And a reporter asks for a word with Nakano telling everyone that it was an amazing campaign. And he has all of them to thank for their hard work and support. A new day is dawning on Gotham. If they all work together. But it's not all smiles for everyone, especially Batman. As he pulls into the cave, he gets out, takes a shower, and begins to pack. He finally moves to Alfred's room, which he's been avoiding until he had to. Once finished, he goes to the courtyard and places a small rock on Alfred's grave, and then heads to his car. After checking to make sure all the animals are secure, Titus barks, and Bruce tells him, All right, everyone say goodbye. It's time to hit the road and make some new memories. As the final guest pulls up into the City Hall District in Gotham City, Mayor Nakano welcomes everyone and thanks them for their investment in making their home a bit safer. Still reeling from the events of the Joker War, Nakano begins to unveil his vision of Gotham, and Bruce already knows that it's just another money grab to get more support for his anti-vigilante movement. However, as he begins to go into the details of his plans, there's a loud laughter coming from the ceiling as the party crashers break in through the skylight. They begin to shoot into the crowd, but Bruce quickly ducks amidst the chaos, going out an unguarded window, and then comes crashing back in through the skylight, taking out the party crashers. But he realizes that something is wrong. The party crashers got their tech from the Joker, who got it from Wayne Enterprises, and without the Joker here to supply them, something's up. This can't be their plan. So with nothing else to go on, he goes back to work making access points across the city, a series of micro bat caves, allowing him to always have something that he can use when something breaks out into the city. The ramifications of the Joker War are that the Joker got rid of most of Bruce's money. He still has millions, but he's no longer in the trillions. So he doesn't have a helipad or a massive subterranean garage that fits 20 bat vehicles. So he had to diversify by making these mini bat caves. And after another night of toiling in the sewers, Bruce returns to his Fort Grey apartment with one of his neighbors, Lydia, running up yelling, Hello, neighbor! She hugs him from behind, asking how lovely it is, and Bruce tells her, lovely, 
just lovely. She tells him good, but she's having a little neighborhood party tonight and he should come. He tries to tell her that he's actually going to call it an early night, but Lydia tells him that she won't accept no for an answer. Plus, everyone feels safer when they know their neighbors, right? So make sure he brings a treat. Bruce goes to the party and he scans the area for all of those in attendance. First, there was Lydia, daughter of Brian Warren III, studied art history, runs communications for her father's company. Next is Sam Turn and his wife, Sarah Worth. Sarah is the daughter of the man who built most of Lower Gotham. Sam runs a tech company that speeds up data transfer. This is his third startup in just as many years. Finally is Deb Donovan, one of the last decent reporters in Gotham. She might also hate Bruce Wayne. But after finally finding a way to sneak back out, Bruce heads out on patrol. Whatever the mayor thinks is Gotham's vigilante problem, Gotham's ecosystem is shifting. New crews are scrambling to get on top of the new crime food chain after the Joker War. This raid was disorganized and loud. What crew heists a gala and takes phones instead of jewelry? This was a chance for the party crashers to put on a show, for a new investor, for a new boss. And the next step in this initiation is always going to be more violent. So time to bring an end to the party crashers. So while Batman is clearing out the party crashers hideout, there's a knock all the way back in his apartment building on Sarah Worth's door. However, something isn't adding up. There's something else, something that Batman isn't seeing. Something bigger than the Joker waiting, and he can feel it. So as morning comes, Bruce heads back to his apartment when he hears screaming coming out of Sam and Sarah's place. He runs over since the couple's apartment is destroyed, and Sam is panicking. He yells at the police asking what they're doing standing around. They have to find his wife. And Deb hears the shouting asking what's going on, and Bruce tells her that it's Sarah. She's gone. Has the nightmare arrived on the elite's front door and exacted its price? But below the streets and in the sewers, Nakano's own personal aide, Neil, walks through with his sleeves rolled up and his hands covered in blood. But while the police got all of the information from Sam that they could, Bruce started trying to put together the pieces of what happened. Most people watch cop shows and how they talk about having this window of finding someone who's gone missing. But cops are fiction. The truth is that when people go missing in Gotham, they're never coming back. But normally with big targets, a ransom isn't too far behind. And in Sarah's case, there was nothing. She's just missing. Batman monitored the police radio and the emergency lines. And he heard that some of the city workers had found a manhole cover that had been tampered with. But with that being his only lead, Batman quickly descended into the sewers below. However, it didn't take him long to find what he was looking for and to really solidify what he said earlier. When you go missing in Gotham, you're not coming back. Batman tells Sarah, I'm so sorry. He shines the light on her body, asking how long she's been here. How long has she been dead? It hasn't been long, but why her and why here? Hidden, but not hidden. Even Gotham's police would eventually. But at that moment, the sound of splashing water can be heard as Gotham's finest begins to charge through the scene. Before Batman even has a chance to turn, the GCPD officers begin to shoot at what they think is their suspect. They're plowing right through the crime scene, making it much harder to catch the killer. All in the name of catching a vigilante threat. Batman doesn't know if they're here for him, the killer, or they're just going insane, and he has no time to find out. As the bullets are flying, one manages to hit Batman in the shoulder, and then another ricochet is coming back and hitting the officer. The issue now is that it would seem that Batman is fleeing from the scene of the crime while injuring an officer. Not a good look for vigilanteism, and not a good look for the mayor's attack on superheroes. The next day, the who's who of the city come to pay their respects for the loss of Sarah. But the tone completely shifts as Sarah's father steps up to the podium. He tells everyone that someone in the city took his daughter. Someone in the city took his daughter, and until he knows who, he has no words of mourning, no words of loss for anyone to hear. There's nothing to say but this. His daughter is gone, and nothing is right until he has justice. Sarah's murder is Gotham's 10th in the last two months. Are Gotham's crime families flexing? Is there a shakeup of power? Mayor Nakano does appear to be using it in some way, and the mayor needs his connections. But while the wound of Sarah's death festers, her partner Sam left the funeral early and disappeared. He hasn't shown up to work in days, and Deb spotted him leaving Sarah's apartment with only a gun. Batman approached him. He could tell that Sam was unhinged, something in his eyes, something other than agony for the loss of his lover. And after turning Sam into the police, 
His rage seemed unnatural. What's more is that at 5 a.m. this morning, a rush order was made to fill the Southwest Tunnel under First Street with concrete, which also just happens to be the location of Sarah Worth's murder. Forensics have already been delayed because the site was declared a health hazard by the city. And now the whole tunnel is concrete. What are they hiding? What is going on? The final nail in the coffin of any possible physical evidence that might be found on location is done with concrete being poured into the crime scene. Why obstruct the investigation that will make the case for justice? Does Sarah's death have a connection to the mayor or to a cop? What are they trying to cover up? Batman needs to figure this out because something about this whole thing is strange. But before Bruce goes into his apartment, after thinking about all of this, he notices someone across the street. And as he takes a closer look, he sees the lifeless corpse of Sarah shuffling towards him. He tries to ask if it's her, but down the sidewalk, his neighbor Lydia sees and calls out asking if it's Sarah. Bruce hears her and quickly grabs the supposedly dead woman, pulling her inside. And as the door closes, Sarah's body begins to what can only be described as melting away in Bruce's arms. When he sets her down, he asks, Clayface? No, it can't be Clayface. You've been gone ever since they got the Knights program was disbanded. And Sarah weakly says, please. But before Bruce could think any further, Lydia bangs on his door, yelling for Bruce to open up. What the hell is he doing? She's calling the police. She knows that she saw Sarah. So a short while later, the two cops are knocking at Bruce's door and he opens up asking if he can help them. Lydia yells, asking, what is this, a social call? Go in. But Bruce asks if there seems to be a problem. The officers barge in, stating that they have reasons to suspect that he is holding someone against their will. And as the officers look around, Bruce tells them that there is no one here but him. But if they have any concerns, they are free to look around his home. Lydia follows in, stating that she heard someone screaming. And Bruce says that he did have the television turned up, and he didn't mean to disturb anyone. After a few moments, the officers leave, stating that they are sorry to bother him. They'll see themselves out. And as the door shuts, Bruce looks back into the living room at the back. He unzips it, seeing the clay person asking how they ended up here and who are they? The night falls and Bruce suits up, quietly sneaking out, but his neighbor Lydia is still watching. As she leaves, Lydia walks out, calling out to him, not realizing that he is out on the roof. And then hears someone calling out to her. She looks back and Neil Betterman grabs her by the arm and Lydia asks, Neil, what are you doing here? Are you wasted? You're hurting me. But before we can see what's going on with that, Bruce did leave as Batman and he sets his bag down when he hears someone calling to him stating that they need to talk. He looks back asking, do you? And he sees Huntress aiming her crossbow at his face. Yes, we do. And whatever you're reaching for, I promise that I'm a faster shot than you. Now, why don't you just tell me what's in the bag before I take off one of your rubber ears? Just then, the clay person, Sarah, breaks out of the bag, spilling over the ledge. And Huntress asks, did you have Clayface in the bag? I'm not completely sure who that is. Might be Lady Clayface. As the two follow, Huntress says that that is not okay. But why does that clay person look like Sarah Worth, the dead woman? Sarah begins to reform on the ground, and as a passing man asks if she's okay, she turns back screaming, DON'T TOUCH ME, and lashes out. Batman barely manages to save the man from getting hit, but Sarah begins to disperse herself, flooding the city, slamming Batman and Huntress into a wall. Batman yells for her to stop this, and she shouts back, LET ME GO! Huntress begins to pull herself out of the clay. I can't kill you with a crossbow, right? Asking for a friend. Sarah screams again as she dissolves from the coming rain into the sewers, and Batman and Huntress begin to follow, with Batman asking, Who are you? Sarah looks up. I am Lady Clayface. Batman kneels down, holding out his hand, stating, I want to take you somewhere safe. You might have the answers that I'm looking for. And later, over at Micro Cave 7A, Huntress tells him that it's a nice place, but it's not a mansion. Batman ignores her, asking Lady Clayface what does she remember, and she tells him that she was at Arkham serving for a conspiracy charge. Then she was attacked, and there was poison, and then nothing. After it, she wasn't human. She couldn't make herself take form. She felt herself flowing away from Arkham underground. For how long, she doesn't know. And then they were there, the man and her. She was crying and screaming and begging him. She said, Neil. Huntress asks, Neil? He made her kneel? And Lady Clayface says that she can't, she's tired. Batman then asks, do you mean Neil? 
Sarah knew a man named Neil, Neil Betterman, tracing his cell right now. Once he has the signal, Batman and Hunter set out, but Neil is on top of a building and something is in his eye. He falls to his knees screaming and then falls onto his back and stops breathing. Huntress arrives looking at the fleshy things wiggling out of his eye sockets asking, what is that? I don't know, but we should probably keep our distance until we find out. However, it doesn't explain why you've been following me. Huntress tells him that a friend of her, Mary Knox was murdered violently. And while she was investigating, she found four other similar cases. And then she saw Sarah Worth's case and heard a police call about Bruce Wayne. You thought Sarah's murder might be with the mob. There's a few factions, including Penguin, making a move to control the crime scene, but this isn't the mob. Did whatever kill Sarah Worth kill Neil? Sarah died of blood force trauma. This isn't blood force. There's blood on his hands. Meanwhile, back at Fort Gray Apartments, Deb Donovan goes out for a cigarette when she sees a bloody bag laying on the streets. She gets closer, asking, Lydia? Lydia! The next day, the sun begins to rise and Huntress begins to process the scene of Neil Betterman when Barbara radios into Batman that he might have to come back home. There's major activity going on. Bruce rushes to take off his costume and when he gets home, he sees Deb and a group of police officers. He asks what's going on and Deb says that the police are looking for him. Someone reported hearing Lydia talking to him last night. Is that true? What are you talking about? Lydia is dead. Lydia was murdered, Bruce. Two women from this neighborhood, your neighborhood, murdered in less than a month. But before Bruce could ask any further, officers walk up telling him that they would like to ask him a few questions. A short while later, at the precinct, the detectives tell Bruce that they appreciate him coming in. They just have a few things that they want to go over with him. Where was he last night? They have reports that he and Lydia were arguing. Bruce tells them, well, I was in my apartment and then went out with a friend. I saw her yesterday afternoon, but the police then came to my house. It was a misunderstanding. Lydia thought that she saw Sarah Worth, but Sarah is dead. When detective asks if he can give the name of his alibi. Yeah, I'll have to get you her name from my phone or call her for her name. But while Bruce is held for questioning, Barbara comes back with information to Huntress about Neil. She found a bunch of cases of ocular discharge that were the result of a parasite. And from what she's been putting together, this is quite possibly concerning. She found 10 cases that look exactly like the images that were sent in, including a sample from Sarah's boyfriend who died in the hospital after the attack and ER doc. The strange part is that all of these medical anomalies started showing up around the same time as there was a huge uptick in violent attacks in Gotham. All of these parasitic cases were fatal as well. But while Huntress tries to gather more information across the city, Mayor Nakano's aide, Hugh Vile, steps out of the office to get something to eat. He walks, he sees a man in an alleyway yelling in his phone, and when the man turns back, he asks, You want a picture or something? Hugh says, No, no pictures. And the man tells him that he can mind his own business. So Hugh walks closer. This is my business. This is what I do. And as Hugh smiles, her eyes begin to turn green as her mouth begins to rip apart and a large parasite crawls out. Back at the precinct, Bruce is now placed into a holding cell. Don't you think that this is a bit extreme? Can I call my lawyer at least? And the officer tells him that there's a hold on that for a moment. Just sit tight and they'll be with him shortly. However, something seems odd to Bruce. He calls out to the officers, but no one answers like everyone has left the building. And then he looks up at the security camera and sees that it's focusing its lenses on him. So it means someone is watching. With a few taps to his watch, he manages to get into the security system and project the feed onto the wall. What he sees is Roland Worth stepping out of his car with a rocket launcher. And a second later, there's a massive explosion with Worth beginning to laugh. He stares at the fire, smiling wide. Justice! <laughs> In the debris of the wreckage, Bruce coughs, lifting himself up as he sees Worth walking towards him. Worth screams his name, and Bruce tells him, I didn't kill Sarah! Worth then pulls out a large gun and begins to fire. You're scum! You took my daughter from me! You took what was mine. Bruce scrambles to get away, but Huntress arrives, telling Barbara that the station is totaled. Do you have any visuals on Batman? Barbara tells her no. The shockwave took out a few blocks worth of cameras. He might have gone underground. And Bruce did just that, sneaking into one of the nearby sewers, opening the door to one of his micro caves. And it's not long when there's a thundering thoom that can be heard as Worth jumps down asking, Do you think you can get away? Rat scum scurrying into your little hole. 
Do you think that I won't blow up this whole city until you're dead? You're wrong! And after a few moments, Worth begins to walk around asking, where is he? And in costume, Bruce punches him. I'm right here! Worth yells that he wants that scum Wayne. He killed his daughter. Tell me where he is! And Batman tells him that Bruce Wayne did not kill his daughter, and neither did he. Why would I believe the words of a coward hiding behind the mask? Give me Wayne. Worth punches down with his massive fist, telling him to get out of the way, and then he grabs his rocket launcher, firing it above Batman's head. The rocket explodes, and Batman begins to run through the sewer, trying to stay ahead of the blast, while the whole sewer system comes crashing down around him. But once clear, Batman jumps back, delivering an uppercut to knock Worth out. And as he falls, he ends up firing another rocket straight up into the air. The blast blows a hole into the street, with Worth charging and grabbing Batman. Do you think you could fight back? This sewer is going to be your final resting place, Bat! But up above, Huntress manages to get on the scene to help a biker from falling into the hole that was now created. The woman yells that that is the third bike that she lost in a month. And Huntress tells her, welcome to Gotham. And then she catches Worth holding Batman. But before she could jump down to join the battle, Batman and Worth hear someone calling out and Lady Clayface shuffles through the smoke. Worth drops Batman. Sarah, Sarah! But before he could reach her, Batman fires the grappling hook, wrapping it around his arm, and as he stops before Lady Clayface, he asks, what is this? Lady Clayface begins to melt and transform into the water. Worth begins to grab at the water, asking, where's my daughter? What happened to my little girl? But after that moment, Worth decided to turn himself in. Batman brought him in without issues, but he was released minutes later. And after that was done, Huntress brought Batman to her apartment, telling her that it's not Wayne Manor, but it's pretty cushy if he asks her. Batman sits down sighing, stating that Worth isn't going to stop until he sees both Bruce Wayne and Batman in Bonnie Bags. Huntress asks if he thinks that Worth has any connections to the other victims, and Bruce Wayne tells her no. What they saw in Neil Betterman's eyes says part of this puzzle is biological. If it's a virus, it could spread far beyond the current cases. It seems more likely that there's something attacking people individually. Huntress says, so they're looking for the epicenter, a main bug. Batman says that Sarah, Lydia, Neil, and Sam, four people connected to whatever this is. What's the other link? Sarah's body was discovered, and within a day, the area was flooded with concrete. Someone would need access to city contracts to make that happen. Could be Neil Betterman. Could be another connection to the mayor's office. Just then, Barbara buzzes in asking if they're watching the news. Worth just did the shortest stint in jail in Gotham history, and he's now holding a press conference. Batman had just turned on the TV to find Worth stating that Bruce Wayne and his protector Batman, Do you two think you can take me for a ride? Do you see me now? You're both dead! Elsewhere, Penguin is watching that same conference smiling. Now this is interesting. I believe that it's time to return Mr. Worth's phone call. Huntress turns back to Batman, asking what is the plan, and he tells her that since Bruce Wayne is wanted and Batman is on Worth's list, they'll wait until dark. Meanwhile, they need to look into the recent civic hires. Who has the reins of Nakano's office? And if he's right, it will be someone new, someone on the outside moving in. Meanwhile, back over at the police station, once the cameras stop, Hugh Vile walks in stating that he would like to express his condolences. His name is Hugh. He works in the mayor's office. Worth tells him to tell Nakano to stay out of his way. But Hugh says actually he isn't representing Mayor Nakano's interests. He's interested in him. He may want help with... Mr. Wayne. Worth grabs Hugh, pushing him into his car, telling the driver to go, and then pulls a gun, telling Hugh to talk. Later that night at the mayor's office is a knock at the door, and Deb Donovan opens the door, stating, Mr. Vile? Mind turning on the lights, not sure why we're meeting at midnight in complete darkness. Hugh says that he appreciates her coming so late, he wanted to meet with her to give her an exclusive story. Deb tells him to get the mayor, she's going to check in with her office, and... But before he could finish, Hugh charges at her with a fire extinguisher. Just then, Batman gets a message from Deb calling for help. Batman traces where the signal came from and states that this is a trap. Not Worth's though. Worth is a blunt instrument. Whoever's behind this wants her to be found. So as Batman and Huntress get into the tunnels, Batman sees Deb tied up next to a bomb, but notices several more spread throughout the tunnels. Batman and Huntress get to work disarming the bombs, but as Batman unties Deb, she tells him that there is something in the office before Batman realizes that a hidden bomb goes off and Worth watches. Kaboom! Hugh smiles as he watches the fire burn. 
As the explosions go off, Hugh Vile begins to laugh. He thinks back to his childhood when he was an ordinary boy until he saw something else entirely. He was a little boy who was always hungry but couldn't eat because of it. The thing inside of him. It is him, and that thing causes him to feed, and it feeds on what it craves, violence. He first came to the city as a child to see the doctors at Gotham General. His mother said that he got sick swimming in a watering hole the summer that he turned eight, which is when she first noticed his mood swings. How he can be ravenous, she said, and not a bite to eat because it wasn't food that he wanted. The doctors tried to kill the foreign fungal infection that he supposedly had with drugs, but nothing worked. The doctor shined a light in his eyes and the creature hated it. They said that he needed to get stronger to fight it. But Hugh only knew one way that he would get stronger and that was by protecting it so that it could get stronger, so that they could get stronger. And he learned what it needed. He learned how to listen to its hunger until its voice became his voice. His mother told him that Gotham City was going to hell. Perhaps that's why it was so easy to produce his victims. And after finding his first victim, he sent them to his next victim. And that's the cycle. That's how Hugh Vile fed with the parasite inside of him, using them as extensions of his hunger out in the world. But back with our current predicament. Batman and Hunters pull Deb out looking for a place to go, but Deb grabs a shard of glass, stabbing it into Batman's side. Hunters quickly grabs her, wondering what's going on, and sees that her eyes are turning green because she is infected. She is an extension of Hugh Vile. But then Worth yells that he doesn't like to do things twice. And this is the last time that I'm going to kill you. Batman ducks under the oncoming bullets, telling him, I'm sick of fighting this battle with you. Worth swings, asking, do you think you're going to get away with hiding the man who murdered my daughter? This ends when you and Wayne are corpses. But Barbara yells over the comms that Nakano just called out a citywide state of emergency, that a lot of Gotham's worst are coming out onto the streets. She has a name for what is causing this, the source of the infections, and if Barbara's research is right, his name is Hugh Vile. Deb Donovan logged a call from him before she disappeared. Huntress is shocked. Vile? That's totally a villain name. No one made that connection. Barbara goes on stating that one of the hospitals has a new victim and they got a sample from his eye and they did some tests and now they're treating him with a combo of antibiotics and UV rays. Seems whatever it is, is light sensitive. And it looks like Vile is downtown, which is, yeah, in the middle of this mess. Nightwing is down there and so are the Batgirls. Over with Batman, Worth is standing up, wiping the blood from his mouth. You should know, once my mind is made up, and never changes Batman. As the thugs begin to walk out to help Worth, Batman says, and you will never know justice. But while Batman is fighting against Worth, Huntress follows Barbara's lead where she finds Hugh Vile seemingly waiting for her. Huntress tells him that she needs to discuss something with him. It's about a missing reporter. And he casually looks at her. I see. Well, given the time, I would say that your missing reporter is dead. End of discussion. But if you want, you can cuff me and take me in but you won't find an ounce of evidence, but you're welcome to try. She grabs her cuffs, telling him that he should know that if he tries to move on her, she's going to inflict a considerable amount of pain. Wonderful. And he opens up his mouth with the parasite beginning to crawl out, and Huntress calls out to Barbara. But it's too late. Hugh latches onto her, trying to infect her, and then stops. Hugh falls over as Huntress pulls out the knife that she plunged into his chest. What, what have you done? Huntress falls to the ground coughing, and the parasite begins to crawl out of her mouth. Back with Batman. These are penguins, thugs. That's who you're teaming up with now, Worth? That's who the man who owns half of Gotham turns to in his time of need, bouncers and thieves? I turn to whoever gets the job done, Batman. Batman steps back. Violence took your daughter, and it won't bring her back. Worth holds up his gun. Goodbye. And Batman flicks his wrist, throwing a small explosive charge at the cement truck. The explosion causes it to burst, pouring its concrete onto Worth, trapping him in place. And then a bolt shoots by, grazing Batman's arm, and he turns back to see the infected Huntress. Hugh watches through her eyes. Even as the blood is draining from my body, I can still have my puppets. Batman fires his grappling hook to bind Huntress, but she uses her knife to cut the cord, lunging in. She pins Batman to the ground while Hugh whispers in her ear to do it. This one will make me feel strong. Put your blade into his throat. 
Batman grabs something from his belt, and as he holds it up, he flips a switch, shining a light into her eyes, blinding Hugh. And with it all said and done, Huntress was free of the parasite's grasp. Worth managed to escape, Hugh Vile went missing, and those infected are now in a stable condition as there is a way to treat it. Huntress responded to the treatments as well, but they have other problems. Because now it looks like a few up-and-coming gangs are taking advantage of the situation, so yeah. Everything in Gotham is kind of a mess after the Joker War, and what is Bruce Wayne, aka Batman, going to do? Barbara asks him this very question. If we're gonna move forward, I need to be able to pursue Hugh Vile without the police going after both Bruce Wayne and Batman. I'm going to turn myself in, Barbara. I hope you guys enjoyed today's video. Make sure you hit that like button and subscribe. As we discovered through our notification bells, only 200,000 of you actually get notices that we put up videos. So if you feel that you've been missing comic story and videos as we do daily videos, please consider turning on that notification bell. On that note, I guess I'll see you guys next time right here at Comic Story.